Hello, and welcome to our inaugural edition of Attitude, a new series where we talk about current and important issues. I'm your host, Mary Arnott. Our goal is to provide you valuable information to help you manage many of life's challenges, with a little attitude, of course. By the way, if you have a topic suggestion for my program, watch the credits at the end of the show on how to contact me. Attitude is produced with the cooperation and resources of HCAM TV to discuss topics that impact our lives. My guest and I want that impact to be a positive one by giving you timely and accurate information to help you think through issues. After all, as Helen Keller once said, people do not like to think. If one thinks, one must reach conclusions. Conclusions are not always pleasant. Well, Helen may have been onto something or not, but I'm betting that with a healthy dose of attitude and good information, all of us can reach a beneficial conclusion especially about child injury prevention, which is the subject of my show today. My distinguished guest today is an expert on child injury prevention. Dr. Christine Barron received her medical doctorate from the State University of New York Health Science Center at Brooklyn in 1995. She completed her pediatric residency at Hasbro Children's Hospital, an affiliate of Brown Medical School in Providence, Rhode Island in 1998. She completed a fellowship in child abuse and neglect at Hasbro Children's Hospital, where her clinical responsibilities included the evaluation of children for physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, failure to thrive, and fictitious illness by proxy. She was recruited in July 2000 to establish the Child Protection Program at UMass Memorial Children's Medical Center. In February 2004, Dr. Barron returned to Brown Medical School as the clinic director for the Child Safe Child Protection Program at Hasbro Children's Hospital, where she oversees all clinical aspects of the program, including training of fellows. She was appointed as the fellowship director of child abuse pediatrics at Brown Medical School in 2007. Welcome, Christine, and thank you for your expertise and your time to discuss child injury prevention. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. Before the show, you were telling me some startling statistics about children and injuries. As an example, you said 25% of kids under the age of 14 every year in the United States require medical attention for injuries they receive. I think you said about 6,000 of those children die from their injuries and 90,000 are left disabled. I mean, that really saddens me. Those, that's actually correct statistics, and I think that they are staggering. Most people do not realize the serious number of injuries that our children suffer, and most of them are occurring within your very own homes. And those injuries itself are things that some people think about, and there are some injuries that occur that most family members have never even thought could occur in their home until unfortunately they happen. Well, I'm anxious then to talk about how we can prevent child injuries and help them be safe. Maybe we could start in the areas of infants. What's new in the way of protection or uh, sleep structures? How have they changed bedding and other things that we use for infants when they're sleeping? Infant sleeping is one of the most important topics to talk about when we talk about injury prevention. Um, infants themselves, we know that there is uh, injury and death that occurs from SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And so what we know is that for infants, they should actually be put to sleep on their back. The Back to Sleep campaign from the American Academy of Pediatrics has been in place for several decades now, and we have actually seen an improvement in the number of cases that the number of cases of SIDS has actually decreased simply by making sure that infants are sleeping on their back. So that's certainly the first thing that everyone should know. But most importantly is the fact that there are unsafe sleep structures, unsafe places where infants are put to sleep. As an example, what would you say would be an unsafe place for a child to be put to sleep? An unsafe place for an infant, believe it or not, would be, for instance, an adult bed. In an adult bed, we often have very soft mattresses. There's a lot of blankets and pillows and soft um, objects that infants who do not have head control yet can have their face covered by that and actually unfortunately suffocate. Or there's spaces sometimes between mattresses and either nightstand or the bed board itself and where infants can actually get entrapped in and cause suffocation, serious injury, or death. So it's important, I think, for all family members to know 
that infants should be placed in safe um, bedding, meaning that they should be in a crib mm -hmm. and or a bassinet when they're first born. It's important to make sure that the crib and or bassinet are new. Many times people can't afford new cribs or bassinets and we'll use older ones. And it's important to check those to ensure that all of the screws are tightened, that there's nothing broken, and that they actually are meeting the current standards for safety. Cribs themselves should make sure that there is a mattress that actually fits that crib. Mm. There should not be a space between the mattress itself and the crib because infants could then get trapped in there. It's important to have a firm mattress. Unlike adults who oftentimes yeah, like soft awesome. mattresses, infants really need a firm mattress. So we need a firm mattress that fits well into the crib. And it's impossible for folks, I think, to think about all the dangers of putting in blankets and stuffed animals. And although they look very cute, they can actually pose a danger for infants. Infants don't need anything else in their crib other than a tight fitting sheet and then one blanket that is tucked in on the three sides and goes up to about the chest level of the infant. So the infant should be lying on their back, as we stated, mm -hmm. and covered with one blanket that is tucked in on all three sides, and nothing else should be in that crib. I think I did everything wrong when my son was an infant. I'm glad he made it through. <laughs> that you're not alone. Yeah. There are many, many folks who use the crib sometimes, too, if a baby's not sleeping in them, sort of as a storage area for a lot of things. And then when someone puts the infant in there, there's a lot of extra blankets, stuffed animals, and pillows. And it really is important to think about the safety. In fact, even bumpers were something that most people will use and they have actually can have been known to cause injury to infants as well. So it's really important to identify that a crib, a sleeping area for a baby to be safe does not need all the fluff and all of the soft pillows because those actually are dangerous for them. I know you've mentioned to me that you've seen many cases of you know infant injury and child injury and um, talk to us a little bit about the crying, shaken baby syndrome mm -hmm. or I mean is you hear about these things in the news and what have you seen and what can you tell us about helping to protect children from injury with respect to that? I think shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma as we call it is one of the saddest things that I ever have to deal with. Um, it has to do with the fact that babies cry and some babies cry a lot and it's actually very normal for every adult to have some frustration with an infant who's crying. And shaken baby syndrome occurs when a caretaker is very frustrated, for usually uh, starting by the infant crying, and results in a caregiver um, picking up that baby and shaking them vigorously. And it doesn't have to take very long. But the fact of the shaking back and forth, actually because babies have very large heads and they have very weak neck muscular ability mm -hmm. to hold their head in place, their head actually goes back and forth, causing injury to the brain inside the skull. It tears vessels, causing bleeding. And your brain is made of two different types of um, tissue, and they weigh different amounts. And so when the baby's going back and forth, it actually tears those two pieces of tissue types apart from one another and can cause either very serious injury, causing lifelong disability, or death of the infants. And so it's really important for anyone who has an infant to share that type of information about how to prevent shaken baby syndrome with every caregiver who will ever watch their infant. So it's important for us to, to teach parents um, very important steps about preventing SBS, shaken baby syndrome. I know you've provided us with some resources from parents um, stress lines and things that we'll show at the end of the show after the mm -hmm. credits. So if anyone needs help to get support from others or help control themselves so that mm -hmm. they don't provide, you know, they don't injure their child like that, we'll have resources for them at the end of the show. The parental stress line is wonderful in Massachusetts. We actually, mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to be part of a pilot project in central Massachusetts where we started a program to educate families uh, to prevent shaken baby syndrome. And really what we were able to do was to educate all family members 
about the dangers of shaking. And to identify that when a baby is crying, it's important to make sure that they're not hungry, that you've changed them, they check their clothing to make sure that there's nothing that's bothering them, and it's totally fine then to put them in a safe place in a crib, just as we talked that we about, talked about yeah. and to walk away. And the most important message is to never pick up a baby when you're frustrated, um, and to make sure that whenever you have someone else watching your infant, you talk with them about that and have a safety net in place. For instance, if you have a babysitter, making sure they're aware of the dangers of shaken baby syndrome, that it is okay mm -hmm. to make sure the baby's okay and then leave them in the crib to sort of decompress from their frustration from shaking and to call you, for instance, to come home. I unfortunately have seen many cases and I had a, a mom once say to me that um, she didn't ask for help because she thought it would make her be a bad mother to ask for help. Mm. And I spoke with her at length about the fact that asking for help is the most important thing you can do. I, I think as a society we are really helpful to families with their first child mm -hmm. and not so helpful on the second child or other children. And in fact, what we were finding at the time that we started our SBS prevention program, it was often a second child that was in the home. And if you think about it, it makes sense because there's a lot of stress in the home. There's a toddler now that you know yeah, obviously a lot needs a lot more that. attention. Yeah. Um, going back to having uh, sleep deprivation can make it very difficult to wake up every three hours and can make it so that a person who would normally be able to deal with the crying and the frustration of, of hearing a baby cry, unfortunately not be able to deal with that well at that time. And so I think it's important for everybody to think about that and let's help our friends and neighbors when in fact they are having their second, third, or fourth child as well. Very good point. And speaking of parents getting help, I know one of the things you mentioned I was very surprised about was that there's actually trained policemen in our communities who can help parents with how to install a child car seat. Yes. They, they go through extensive training to actually be able to help the parents install it properly for infants and toddlers. Can you tell us a little bit about that in, in the programs? Absolutely. I think that everybody takes for granted that we have laws for uh, safety car seats for every age. And it's important to know that you can call your local police departments um, either the local police departments and or another agency that they will be aware of usually have sites where they actually will install car seats for you. In Hopkinton, um, as you were able to tell me today, there's uh, two officers, an officer, Buck Lee and Higgins, who have gone through the training. It seems so silly, but in fact, most uh, car seat technicians to be certified in that have to complete a 40-hour course in order to do that. And Every day in this country, folks are putting in their own car seats, of course. And so it is important to use that uh, resource in order to have this car seats placed properly. The problem comes in many families where you have to move the car seat from one car to another based on the time when people are dropping off mm -hmm. or picking up children at different times. If you have the luxury and ability to have more than one car seat, have both cars, for instance, in a family, go and have them properly installed and then don't take them back out until the child is out of them. It's important because the car seat itself does not protect the child if it's not installed properly. Mm -hmm. So although you have buckled them in to the five point restraint of the seat, if the car seat isn't tightened into the seat itself, if there was an accident, then that baby will get injured because the car seat itself will bounce around within the vehicle. So it is important to, number one, ask for the resource. Ask for help. Ask for help. It's, it's never a bad thing to ask for help. Have the car seats properly installed. Have them installed in all the cars that you'll use if it's possible. And if not, if you have to move your own car seat, it's important to make sure that when you install the car seat, it is tight enough so that you actually cannot move the car seat itself within the car. I would imagine they would be also, as part of their training, 
know if you've gotten the proper seat for your infant or toddler depending on their size and weight and the standards that we have in Massachusetts about getting the right car seats for them. Absolutely. Most people want to uh, change over too quickly from a rear-facing infant seat to a front-facing seat. Mm -hmm. It is important. One of the things I tell everybody is talk to your pediatrician or family physician before you transition your child from an infant seat that's rear-facing to front-facing so that you can make sure that your child meets the recommendations for safety in order to turn them front fa sorry, facing front. Facing front and yeah. in addition, once you even transition your children then out of a car seat into a booster seat, again, there are set standards and it's important to ask your family physician and make sure that your child meets those standards because otherwise then they're not safe in the car. I know in the infant area, especially for new parents, there must be so much that they think about and worry about. Are there other p key areas, though, that you'd like to highlight about keeping infants safe and, sh and preventing mm -hmm. child injuries for them? One of the, the biggest areas um, happen in, in the bathroom. So what the, we say that the bathroom is actually one of the most unsafe rooms in a house for many reasons. One is during bath time, which is a wonderful time to play with infants, most infants enjoy their baths. It's important though to make sure that it's done in a way that's safe, that we can prevent burns from hot water mm -hmm. and also prevent near drowning or drowning of infants. In order to do that, it's best to actually have an infant bathtub that goes into the regular adult size bathtub. And you should fill it with the water first and there's many products out there now that you can actually test the water test temperature, the temperature. Mm -hmm. because that's one of the most difficult things to do. Make sure that you've actually gathered everything that you need for the bath first. Oh, good point. Mm -hmm. Get the towels ready, get the soap. <laughs> Put the baby Make in and leave sure to get something exactly. else. Exactly, right. and no matter what that is, whether it's the phone ringing or whether you have forgotten something or whether somebody's at your front door, Never ever leave a baby unattended in the water. It's very, very important. And when I unfortunately have seen many children who have had near drowning mm -hmm. based on literally the fact that the phone rang and so somebody went to answer the phone or that they forgot the cup that they usually use to mm -hmm. rinse off with the baby and they've left the baby to go get it. If for whatever reason, once the baby's in the tub that you need to leave, take a towel, take, take. take the baby up and take the baby with you. It's very, very important. I say to you to, to fill this infant tub by yourself first because if you have water running, there's always the chance, based on where you live and your water temperature and, and the force of water that you have, mm -hmm. that if you have a bath that's running, if the water turns too hot, then there can cause a burn to the baby. So the safest thing is to actually fill the infant tub, move it back away from the spigot, before you put the baby in. And that way, if you have to run water, you can feel the temperature again itself, mm -hmm. and it's not gonna run right on to the infant. It's really important to make sure to prevent burns. Very good points. Anything else in the infant area? Yeah. Choking hazards, I think you've mentioned some things here that you left me some notes, so is yeah. there? Um, you know, infants, once they become mobile in any way, even able to sit up at six months, mm -hmm they will uh, gain a grasping ability at nine months. And the first thing they do with anything they can get their hands on is to put it in, in their mouth, mouth, of course. So it's really important to literally get down on the floor where you're placing your infant about six months of age who'll be sitting up and really crawl around on the floor and look at what's there. Because at their eye level, you could easily miss things if you're not down at that level. And the most difficult thing is when you have different age children because the older age children play with toys that have very small pieces that are a choking hazard for young infants. And mm -hmm. so it's important for you to recognize that and to keep those objects separate in a separate area than where the infant will be. Well, now that we have all these good notes on how to protect our infants, Long comes the fact that they're going to turn into toddlers and they'll be very active and adventurous and it seems like all their environments then become you know, opportunities for toddlers to really get injured. What are some of the things in the caring for toddlers that you would like to highlight about preventing injuries for them? 
you know, toddler age is just a wonderful age. They are learning so many new things. And what I tell everybody is, at each new stage, their ability to climb and to explore mm -hmm. should be really a fun time for parents. And that's why it's so important to think about injury prevention before that and really try to prevent injury from occurring. So one of the most important things for toddlers is that they will get into almost anything. Well, we have all this great information on how to keep our infants safe. And just when we're feeling comfortable, they become toddlers. <laughs> and toddlers are adventurous. And they look for opportunities, I think, sometimes to get themselves in trouble. So where would you like to start in telling us how we can keep our toddlers safe? You're so right. You know, toddlers really do get into everything, which is, is the beauty about having toddlers. It's really a fun age. They're learning such new things but they learn things such as climbing um, and to get into a lot of things that could in fact cause an injury to them. So it is an important age when your infant has transitioned into toddler stage and they're mobile to really go back through your whole house and re-childproof and thinking about what is my child able to do right now and what sort of trouble could they get into in the house and try to think one step ahead at least. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you have a toddler who is cruising, so they're holding on to the furniture and starting to walk, you want to make sure that all of your furniture is actually stable so that you don't have, for instance, a coffee table that as soon as they're mm -hmm. grabbing onto that for, to steady themselves as they're walking, it's not going to tumble down on them. I talk to families all the time about making sure that they will make sure that their TVs, for instance, are truly anchored so that they can't fall on a toddler who's going to now be putting weight and pressure onto the stand for the TV. It's important to do that for dressers. You would be surprised how quickly toddlers learn to pull out those drawers oh, and make stairs out of them. Oh. So anything that's heavy in your house, make sure that it's actually either A, sturdy enough so that it cannot happen, where mm -hmm. it can topple over on your child, and if it is something that could, to anchor it to the wall and make sure that it has an anchor support. This includes things like dressers, TVs, but also, believe it or not, your household appliances in your kitchen, such as your stove. So one of the things I tell all of my families is, go home and open up your oven door, put your foot on it and push on it a little bit and see if the stove doesn't lean forward. If it does, then you need to anchor your stove, for instance, to the wall. Because as a toddler, even though the oven may not be on, if they get the door open and they step on it to climb and you happen to be cooking things on the stove, they could get burned from the items that are on top of the stove. So it's important to sort of go through your house and really think through what can they get into. Again, one of the most dangerous places of the house is the bathroom. And we have a lot, usually chemicals and the like, underneath the sink in the bathroom and also in, in the kitchen. In the kitchen yeah. and, and that's fine when they first are starting to toddle around. But older toddlers, I don't know about you, but most of them that I find, actually, we, they are able to open up all of the devices that Anything the adults so. can't figure out how to open yeah. up. But the children do. And so if you have a child who is a really good at opening up locks, then you really have to think through the process and actually move all those chemicals, for instance, to a top shelf in a closet that they really can't reach. So you want to make sure that everything is out of their reach unless it's something that's safe for them. It's also really important to make sure that you take the time to make their environment safe because you want them to explore their environment. It's a wonderful opportunity for them. You don't want to stunt their ability to explore their environment, but you want to make sure it's safe. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things I find is that sometimes we're really good at doing that on our own houses, but we take our children other places, such as to grandmother's house or to other family or friends' homes, and it's important to make sure that all environments that they're playing in are safe for their age group. You're reading my mind because I was thinking about child care or taking a child to, you know, a, a, a outside of your home and leaving them for the day yep. and you know to make sure that those environments are just as safe and they're using the precautions that you mentioned. Absolutely and like I said one of the most important things to do is actually to get down on their level crawl around in the living room and see if there's anything that they can get into. People are very good about thinking about plugging um, the electrical sockets which is very important mm -hmm. but may not be thinking about other wires for instance that are you know 
sticking out from the television. That they could tug on or they something. They could tug yeah. on. Something would either fall on them. They may chew on it and then get an electrical shock. So these are things important to make sure that they don't have access to. Very good points. Um, you talked about car seats and um, uh, bath water and things for infants. I would imagine we're doing the same sort of things with the toddler group. Uh, and sometimes we let our guard down and we shouldn't be doing that at this right. point. Yeah, obviously the difference is you're not going to have an infant tub then for the toddler. They're mm -hmm. going to be using the adult sized tub. But some of the same message is important where you would actually fill the tub to the level that's appropriate, mm -hmm. testing the water. Again, there's many products that you can actually just slip right into the water and it tells you whether the temperature is okay or not. And then turning off the water. It's important that you never leave a toddler alone in the water just as an infant because many times they actually will either A, stand up and play so with play the with controllers the and they can cause a burn, or they may try very hard in their soapy little feet in order to step up on the edge of the tub to reach something and, and fall and cause a serious injury. Mm -hmm. So it is important that you never leave them alone in the water as well. One of the things that um, I think that most pediatricians talk to their families about is that your water temperature should be at 120 degrees. And for me, I thought, I'm not really sure where my water heater is, and I'm telling everybody to do this, so yeah. how will I do this? And so I think it's important for families to know why we say that. At 120 degrees, it's actually very safe. And for anyone who's had a toddler, you know that they may be out of your sight for 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. That That's can happen, here. certainly. At 130 degrees, just 10 degrees hotter, a full thickness burn can occur in less than 30 seconds. But at 120 degrees, where we want everybody's water temperature to be, mm -hmm. that same burn takes 10 minutes of exposure to the water. So it makes a huge difference, and water temperature should be at 120 degrees. It's the safest thing, especially when you have toddlers in your home, because if they turn the water on and it's hot, it would take them 10 minutes to get a full thickness burn versus 30 seconds at 130 degrees. And I would bet most people don't test their actual temperature of their water at home. I know mine's very, it's much higher. I just happen to know that, but I don't have any, you know, mm -hmm. toddlers in the house anymore. Yeah. So, uh, but that's yeah. a good thing to check then on your water heater and make sure. Absolutely. And I tell everyone, it's a good thing to have good habits. And so one habit is that when you have to run your water to it being very hot, get in the habit of then letting it run cold before you turn the water off. That way, the next time someone turns the water on, it's not hot immediately. Hot and most of the time, that's when we would see injuries for uh, children, is when they are able to get up and actually turn on the water by themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you, especially on the water setup where there's one handle that controls hot and cold, if you have run the water hot and then they come by right after you and turn on the water, it's going to be very hot. So if you have to run hot water, make sure you run it cold first before you turn it off. I've done that to myself many times at home because I keep my water Absolutely. hot and I've left it and I go turn it on and yeah. And you put your fingers times. in and then you quickly pull them away. Yeah. Um, so that is something that's very important. And if you get into the habit of doing it all the time, then it's less likely that there's going to be any burn that occurs for your toddler. Same way as for cooking, cooking on the back burners, making sure all your handles are turned in. You know, toddlers are very curious and they will find their way to reach up um, and grasp the handles. Um, if you have a stove where you have knobs in the front, sometimes you actually have to remove your knobs for when you're not cooking because otherwise the children will learn how to turn them on and turn the stove on. And they do have those guards now you can put on the front of your stoves that'll give you a little more height so the toddler can't reach up and touch something that's hot and yep. on the stove or touch the burner. Yep. Or Absolutely. So the same thing all in kinds some of very old yeah. um, apartments and houses. You know, they're beautiful homes, but they also have exposed furnaces where um, the heater itself is exposed. And there are covers that you can buy so that you can make sure that a burn does not occur by the child touching the hot heater. Okay. Um, I'm looking at some of the notes you had given me too, and you know, things that we might not normally think about, but windows, oh, windows. windows being open, oh, especially yes. <laughs> upper floors. Yeah. They, one of the campaigns they had done actually in Brooklyn was that kids can't fly, and it's very true. Unfortunately, we see children who are injured from falling out of windows uh, often, 
way too often. So some of the things that are important to know is that you know children are going to climb, and so sometimes the thought process is, well, I'll put something in front of the window so the child can't get access to it, but in fact what you're doing is making an area where they're going to climb up, for instance, if you put a couch in front of the window, they're going to climb up on the couch and they're going to have access to the window. A screen is never going to hold a child, mm -hmm. um, and so there are specific window guards, but they can be quite tricky um, to actually install. And so you may need help from uh, someone who knows how to install them, or if you are in a situation where you're renting and you don't have an option of putting a guard in, make, just make sure there's nothing by the window that the toddler can climb up on, and actually open the windows from the top so that the bottom part of the window is closed. And that way they actually can't push against the screen and fall out. All right, well, let's hope that everybody survives that toddler stage, and we're moving to older children now. I know some of the same things we've talked about, though, in terms of making sure your home is you know, safe and medications, maybe they're up on higher shelves and they can't get to them. What area, other areas, though, in terms of older children would you like to highlight for us? One of the things when you say to me about medication just reminds me to always say that again when they're going to visit relatives to make sure that medicines are locked away because oftentimes especially if they're going to visit with grandparents or other families they may have uh, medications that's not in childproof caps because they don't have children that are normally in that environment mm -hmm. um, or there may be medication that's left out in an area to remind somebody to take them oh, but right. they're at reach then for toddlers and older children and mm -hmm. oftentimes they will in fact take medicine thinking it's candy um, and some medications even if they just take a piece of it and spit it back out can still have serious consequences so it is important to make sure that all medicines are are locked away or at least out of their reach in all the environments that they're in. We've got older children now though too that are riding bikes and mm. using skateboards and yeah. other things and I know there's some safety areas there that you'd like to talk about. Absolutely. It is so important to make sure the kids use helmets. Um, I think that getting kids used to having a helmet on on anything that has wheels from the very beginning and being very strict about that. You're, for instance, you're not allowed on your tricycle without your helmet. Mm -hmm. Starting from a very young age, again, builds habits, and habits actually will help keep your child safe. It doesn't mean that they're never gonna get an injury, they're gonna get a scrape, they're gonna get a bruise. Obviously, those things are gonna happen. What we're trying to prevent are serious injuries. And I tell all of my patients, the most important part of your body is your brain, <laughs> and you need to protect it. And it's important to wear a helmet on any bike, on skateboards. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the kids now use little scooters, mm -hmm. even Heelys, sneakers that have little wheels on them. Is that what they call those That's things? That's what they call those things. They actually, it's very interesting if you looked at um, their new ads, everybody's in helmets and full pads, which is a very important thing. We see a lot of children from skateboards, Heelys, from, um, any type of uh, device with wheels actually having um, forearm fractures. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, several children who, you know, have both arms fractured then at the same time. And although they get to choose different colored casts, one for each arm, we certainly would like to prevent that from happening. And a helmet itself is so important because brain injury itself we can't fix as, me as medical professionals. We cannot. And so mm -hmm. it's important to make sure that they're wearing a helmet, but make sure that it fits them correctly and that they're actually wearing it because sometimes, as I tell my, my patients, you may have a helmet, but if it's in your garage when you fall down the street, it's not going to help you at all. Yeah. yeah, I saw a young little kid the other day in the, in the grocery store and he's coming down the aisle with these little Heelys and I'm thinking, is he going to stop before he runs into <laughs> me? He did not have any helmet or shoulder or, um, Elbow pads, pads or anything on, though. I think it's probably tough to get them to wear those when they're... It can be very dangerous. Yeah. And even now, I mean, there's a, there's a, a very big push to have children wear helmets when they're skiing, um, mm -hmm. sled riding. Winter will be here before we know it. Um, and it, it's sad because I know for most folks, they think, well, I used to do that all the time as a kid myself, and we never used helmets. And I never used a helmet as a, as a child because they really weren't even made for us at the mm -hmm. time. Um, but the injuries that I see every day, if folks saw them, 
you would never ever get on a bike or do any sport activity to which you could injure your head um, without wearing a helmet. And so unfortunately, maybe we should then, schedule some trips to the hospital so kids could see please. others that have been hurt, and maybe they'll be a little yeah. bit more cautious. Right. So. And the, unfortunately, the problem is that once it happens, you can't undo it. And so mm -hmm. that's what's so important about injury prevention: knowing what can happen and doing everything you can to prevent it. Now we're transitioning into teenagers yeah. now. Of course, teenagers are supposed to be more capable of taking care of themselves, and they are, but they also seem to be very prone to injuries and some very serious ones. So I'd like to spend some time really talking about teenagers and um, helping to focus parents. And don't forget that your teenager still needs to be given some education and some lectures sometimes about how to be safe. Absolutely. Where would you like to start with teenagers? Well, with teenagers, again, I think that you know they're involved in a lot of activities with skateboarding and the like. So just as we talked about the younger children, it's still important as a teenager to wear a helmet. And you know, I know very well that you know it's not fashionable. It may mess up their hair. We go through all this when we mm -hmm. talk, but it is so important. And I talk with them about children who I have seen who have serious brain injury from a simple fall. Um, and try to get them to understand it is important to wear their helmets just like all the other younger kids. I think the other things for older kids is that um, we always worry about peer pressure and peer pressure is one of those things for all teenagers and so that leads to several things. For instance, specifically if you have guns in your home, it's one of those things that peer pressure has found that you know, sort of asking teenagers, let me see the guns that you have in your house, for instance. And it's important to make sure that your teenager is aware um, that that's not okay. And secondly, to make sure that all guns in homes are stored with trigger locks, with uh, a lock itself, that um, is not accessible to anyone in the home other than the adults. That's important for them to do. So maybe parents need not to be shy about asking other adults if they have guns in the home where their children are going to and to make sure that they're secured and that no one can get access to them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's very important to know how safe environment is. No matter how safe you make your own environment, mm -hmm. your children are always going to transition into other environments. and. Asking that question, although some people may feel uncomfortable, may save a life. And it's very important to make sure that anywhere your child is, that they're safe. I know there's so many directions we could go with teenagers. We could talk about school and drugs and cars, and yeah. it goes on and on. So I know that we would probably take up another hour of time if we did all of that. But mm -hmm. maybe there's a couple of areas that Mm. Uh, concerning teenagers that yeah. you would want to just highlight and we'll give resources to parents to get information and other things. Sure, cars I think are a very big issue for teenagers. It is so exciting to get your permit and then your license and I think it's really important because it's as children are starting to drive we drive so much in this country that I think kids don't realize the serious danger of driving a car. Mm -hmm. With car accidents itself, I think that understanding why there's speed limits and how dangerous it can be for teenagers who are inexperienced drivers to start with to drive fast is very important. We see many accidents now, and believe it or not, if you look at the statistics, most teenagers who get in an accident the, re the reason for the accident are either that they are listening to the radio, talking on the phone, texting, if you would imagine, while they're driving now. I've seen it. <laughs> um, I just can't imagine sort of driving and texting at the same time. Um, or having more um, children, uh, you know, teenagers in the car at the same time. So what happens is that when a teenager is learning with their parent, you try to instill in them very serious how, how, you know, how serious it is about driving. But when you're not in the car, they have to also be able to make good choices. Mm -hmm. And so educating your teenager about the fact that you know, they really shouldn't have other children in the car with them because it can be a distractor. Playing the music loud is a distractor you know, identifying that they should not be talking on the phone or texting. Mm -hmm. And at the same token, I think that we see a lot of injuries from uh, kids that are playing around. So oftentimes, for instance, in a parking lot where they're car surfing 
uh, where another child is sitting on the hood of the car and someone's driving and it it's made initially for them to think that it's fun. I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> and as soon as you stop that that other teenager falls off and again certainly is not wearing a helmet mm -hmm. and we have seen serious brain injury from car surfing as well as fatalities. Um, and it's devastating to the families, oftentimes their friends, um, and it's certainly not what they anticipated. They're thinking about the fun aspect of it but not recognizing how dangerous it is. And so I think part of uh, teenagers learning when they're driving, it mm -hmm. is to make sure that they understand the dangers that can occur when they're driving. And I don't think we even have time to go into things like don't drink and drive, don't no drugs under you know. I mean, there's there's a whole nother level with teenagers, but at least we can start as early as possible, like you say, educating them about how to be safe when they're driving or how to be safe when they're involved in sports or you know. Absolutely. And to be honest with you, this is also the age that we should, going back to our very first talk about shaken baby syndrome, you know, teenagers are going to become babysitters. And oftentimes this is the time that they're starting to babysit and it's a good time to educate them about the frustrations of infant crying um, mm -hmm. and to make sure they understand the dangers of shaking an infant because as they're babysitting, um, when they become teenagers, this is a really good opportunity to teach them that information. And you make a good point about that. Teenagers can go through classes uh, about how to be good babysitters and learning CPR and other things that they should be equipped with so that they can help take care, better care of infants and toddlers that they may be watching. So that ties that whole thing back in together. That It does, absolutely. Um, as we looked at all of the groups, the infants, toddlers, older children, teenagers, we've covered so many areas. and probably so many more that we could. But is there anything else that you can think of that you would really like to highlight in each of the groups or across the groups of the, of the children where you've seen so many injuries in the hospital? Um, what would you like to leave the parents and grandparents and our babysitters with in terms of caring for these folks? I think the most important message when you're thinking about injury prevention is to not think it won't happen to someone in my family. It's to really take the step forward to say that injury can happen anywhere at any time to anyone. And it's really important to think about what could happen in each scenario, for instance, that we've talked about, whether it's in the bathtub or whether it's because you're cooking, mm -hmm. and really think about what could happen so that you can make the steps early to prevent injury from happening. Because once the injury happens, we can't take that back. And unfortunately, as we said right in the beginning of the show, you know, there are so many children who are injured or who are left disabled from injuries. And so I think it's important to think ahead. And like we said before, I think it's important that you make sure your home is safe, but you want to make sure that every environment that your children are going into, no matter what age, that you also take the time to make sure that those environments are as safe as possible for every age group of child that you have. So we should tell our parents, don't be embarrassed or afraid to go over someone else's house to check out the environment, maybe even in the school at the younger grades to make mm -hmm. sure that things are safe. And if you leave them at daycare, it's perfectly within your right to go check to make sure it's a safe environment. Absolutely. Don't be embarrassed or afraid to do that. And don't be afraid to ask questions, ask for help, go to the police departments like we talked about for the car seats, but also turn to your family and your friends when you do need some help with your children. Christine, we talked about car seat safety and infants, but is there anything specific about infant carrier car seats that you'd like to share with us? Yes, as we stated, you could have the base placed by a special technician through the police department or fire department in, mm -hmm. your, in your home area. But what happens is that in the infant carrier car seat, you remove the carrier piece. And it's very, mm -hmm. very important to make sure, number one, that the infant is always strapped in because as you're carrying the infant in the car seat, if it's angled different, they could certainly fall out of the carrier itself. Mm -hmm. But in addition, one of the most dangerous things that we see every day 
is folks who are going in to go shopping, carry the infant in the infant car, carrier car seat, and put it in the front of the push cart, which is good because they can see the infant. Unfortunately, most of the infant carrier car seats do not fit very well in the, big, in the front part. So either they're unbalanced, and I have seen infants become injured because the entire car seat falls off mm -hmm. of the push cart because it doesn't sit well, and unfortunately have seen serious injury when during the time of shopping, someone has unbuckled the infant to take them out. Maybe they were fussing and crying. They calm them, and they put them back into the infant carrier car seat, but never strap them in. And when you go to pick it up sometimes, it is snug. And unfortunately, your first response is to pull harder. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I've seen several injuries of infants who have had that happen. And basically, tugging harder catapults the infant out of the car seat onto the floor. So to prevent this type of injury, it's important to, first and foremost, always, always keep the infant strapped when they're in the infant carrier car seat. Mm -hmm. And the safest thing to do is actually to place it in the larger basket part of the push cart so that that seed itself fits into the larger area and it's easy to actually lift out of the larger infant, um, in, uh, out of the push cart itself and it's safer for them. Sometimes if you're in buying several things, you may need two shopping carts that way, mm -hmm. but it is safer. And that same point though, it goes across everything. If an infant is in any carrier, any seat, any swing, they all have seat belts, basically. And I unfortunately see so many injuries because someone will place an infant in a swing, for instance, and not buckle them in, thinking, well, they'll be fine. They're not moving very much. Mm -hmm. But the moment that they are, or the angle is different, and gravity, unfortunately, will pull them out, they will slip out of, the, out of swing and also cause injuries that way. So it's very important to, number one, always make sure they're buckled in. And secondly, never put the infant carrier car seat in the front section of the push cart. It can be quite dangerous. I, you know, they have the little places for the feet to go through now, and they can actually yes. just sit them in the front. Yep. And sometimes I see very young infants or toddlers being actually just set right mm -hmm. into the cart like that, and it yep. makes me a little bit nervous when I see parents do that. Yeah. Really, right. until a child's able to sit up on their own, they have their own head control, which usually happens at six months or later, depending on the child. Mm -hmm. um, uh, until they are able to sit on their own, they shouldn't be um, sitting in the front of the push cart itself because they're only going to fall forward and movement of that cart will actually cause them to hit their nose or mouth onto the metal section of the, the cart itself. So nobody should be placing their children in that front part until they're really capable of sitting well on their own. And would you say even then make sure you're watching them at all times that they're not reaching for things Absolutely. or trying to get out or? Absolutely, and again, using the seatbelt that is there. It's there for a reason mm -hmm. because otherwise they're gonna stand. And that's quite a height um, if you have a toddler who is standing in the front of the push cart, when they fall from that height, and usually the f in the stores, the floor is really uh, linoleum over concrete, it can cause a serious injury. I know one of the areas that we talked a little bit and touched on, but I was hoping we could spend some more time, goes really across infants, toddlers, older children, teenagers, but relative to poisons and medications. We, we talked a little bit about medications, but not so much on the poisons, um, and maybe getting some help if you, if your child has taken something and they shouldn't, what would you like to tell us about the poisons and protecting children? Many times children will ingest some poison that you're not really sure what it is. Um, it's mm -hmm. always important to actually call the poison control center so that you can identify what it is and what you should do. Sometimes um, you may find an infant or toddler in an area where there's several pills and you're not certain if they've even taken any or not. It's always better to be safe and make sure that you bring the child into the emergency department to be evaluated because some of the medications that are for adults uh, could be fatal for, even in very small doses for, for infants. Um, there is a poison control number that is nationwide which is one 800 222 
one two 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 and it's important to have that number it's also important to know that years ago um, it was standard for everybody to have Ipecac it's a medicine that makes oh, children yes. vomit yes. and it was that. it was standard to have Ipecac in everyone's home but what we have found is that several types of poisons can actually cause more damage if in fact you, in, you induce vomiting in a child. And therefore that is no longer recommended. So anybody who has Ipecac in their house should get rid of it. And um, nobody should be given Ipecac to a child who has ingested any medication or poison. It's imperative that you call the poison control center or bring them into the emergency department. Okay, call 911 and then the poison control. I mean, there must be Absolutely. several things that you can do, but not give them that to cause the vomiting anymore. Correct, because there are some medications and some poisons, for instance, that are uh, acidic, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, they are causing a burn, for instance, of the esophagus as it goes down, and if you cause them to Can vomit, it causes more burn as they're actually vomiting. So it's very important that uh, you speak to somebody, again, calling 911, calling the Poison Control Center, and again, even if you are concerned that they possibly ingested some poison or some medication, not sure, mm -hmm. but have a concern, it's more important to make sure that that child is evaluated. And then follow up maybe with their doctor after they've been treated just for making sure that they're not having any reoccurring things or is that not done so much anymore? Because they used to always oh. tell you, if you go to the emergency room, then the next day you're, you know, you're home, follow up with your pediatrician and make sure that they're aware that they have that information on your child. Absolutely, always important to follow up with your own physician um, after any visit to the emergency department. It also would be a very good time to reevaluate your home for the injury prevention issues that we've been talking about here mm -hmm. today. I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Christine Barron, for sharing your knowledge, your experience uh, with us on this very important topic of child injury prevention and for giving our audience such valuable information about it. And I'd also like to thank the HCAM staff and volunteers who made this show possible. If you want to be part of our team, have a question, or want a copy of this program, visit our website at hcam.tv. If you have a topic you would like discussed on Attitude, you're welcome to send me an email at attitude at hcam.tv. Thank you for watching Attitude. I look forward to sharing more ideas and conversations with you on our next episode. And so I leave you with this closing thought. As author, learning disability specialist, and teacher, Mary McCracken says, level with your child by being honest. Nobody spots a phony quicker than a child. Until next time, I'm Mary Arnott, signing out with Attitude. <music>
um, 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 in, um, 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 um,